Good stuff. So guys, let's start out. Hello, welcome to the Pig Daily, episode number 65. Today we're going to talk about jargon. It's going to be a beginner basics episode where I fill you guys in on some of the words and just general, overly technical and sometimes really stupid terms <laughs> which we use in the StarCraft community. A lot of the words have a lot of meaning and they're very specific. So um, even though some of the words probably aren't the best chosen, uh, best chosen words, they're ones that have just evolved naturally, it's something which... Uh, understanding these words is so important to understanding and kind of enjoying getting into the game. So this really is something where hopefully the discussion of some of these points is interesting for experienced players as well. I've already tweeted out um, kind of asking people what cheese is. That's something we're going to talk about later. And there's been a lot of responses and quite a few ones which were really different. Um, so that's going to be interesting to talk about. And hopefully you guys can all weigh in in chat. As always, put forward your disagreements and uh, and all that sort of stuff. Shout out. Any, anything you, you think is different, anything you think should be defined differently. Uh, the most important thing from today's episode, and this is only going to be the first part, I'm going to have to revisit this and cover more terms because there is so much technical wording in StarCraft. Um, but the idea is for a new player coming into the scene, they can watch this video and at the end of it, they're going to understand all of the most important key terms. So when they're watching commentary, um, you know, you, you've watched this video, you can watch commentary and you can actually understand 95% of what the cast is talking about um, and kind of get past that initial hump of being what the hell are these things. So today we're going to talk about cheese, micro, uh, we're going to talk about the meta game. Um, we're going to talk about APM, macro, obviously micro and macro go hand in hand. And we're going to talk about all the different expansion terms. Um, so let's dive right on in. And uh, I've just got a random kind of replay. I just grabbed. Don't really care about the game. Um, but this is from WCS Mexico. It is Neeb vs. Uthermal uh, in the third, fourth place match. It is map one of their set on Galactic Process. And why am I putting this on? Because I like to have some example on screen of a specific game or whatever. Um, <clears throat> also, the first thing we're going to be talking about is those expansion terms. So guys, uh, let's dive on in and first of all talk about those. Now, the first word that you end up hearing a lot in the StarCraft community is your natural. So, you're new to StarCraft, what is a natural? This is your natural, or to be specific, this is Euthermal's natural. Your natural is the closest possible expansion to your main base. Notice, its main base is here, just down the ramp. There will almost always, on every map, uh, at least in the competitive ladder, be a natural expansion. This is your second base, and usually it's quite an obvious one. Uh, it always has the same number of resources every base in StarCraft 2 does, eight minerals and two gases, except for gold bases like this one down here, where there is only one, two, three, four, five, six gold minerals, but they mine a lot faster, so uh, you still get more value out of it, at least initially. Now... There is also another term you will occasionally hear, which is back natural. So I do want to um, very quickly show you guys a map called Dusk Towers, because in the previous map pool, this one included, um, this was a situation where there actually were back naturals on multiple maps. In the current map pool, we don't actually have any maps with back naturals. Now, the idea of a back natural is when you have a sort of, or an in-base natural is what people will also call it sometimes, uh, is when you have a very well protected one. So on this map, this is where you spawn if in the top right and your opponent spawns down there in that bottom left. Now what you'll notice is that you've actually got this nice base tucked right up into the corner and it's a back natural or an in-base natural, super easy to take and protect. And the key feature of this is that for your opponent to attack it, they need to go through your main base. And what that means is they need to go up a very tight, narrow ramp because a feature of StarCraft is that main ramp will always be very tight and narrow, allowing you to defend your one base very easily. With Protoss, a single force field will block that ramp. With Terran, you can wall off that ramp very easily. And with Zerg, it means they've got to come right into your main base creep in order to actually make anything happen. So that's uh, something you always want to keep in mind there. So that's your, se your second base. Beyond that, bases are just referred to as third, fourth, fifth, and so on. So generally, you say, oh, he's going to attack his third. He's going to attack his fourth. Well, where exactly is the third? It totally depends on where the player takes the third base. So... On this map, for instance, Euthermal could opt to take this third up here, but he could very easily, if we zoom on out, take this base down here, as they're about the same distance from his natural. This one's a little bit more exposed to attack, but it's kind of kind of on a forward path where his army's going to be going past anyway. Past anyway. 
you don't necessarily look at a map and say, this is your third base every single game. It's always dependent on where the players choose to take it. There's always certain options available. Sometimes on certain maps it is kind of obvious, like, well, this is the only base that's close for a third, but so on. Same with the fourth base. If this is the third, this is probably going to be the fourth, and so on and so forth. A few other expansion terms which we do need to cover very quickly. FE is fast expand. This is something we don't use as much in Legacy of the Void, but I know some people still in their build orders talk about FEs. Um, FE just means fast expand. It's any build where you expand very quickly into the game. Um, and it simply is something where, especially back before Legacy of the Void, when the game didn't start off quite as fast, players used to talk a lot about FEs because it was harder to secure your natural. Now in Legacy of the Void, at least at pro level, it's very standard to do an FE, to do a fast expand. We see here Neeb only gets a gateway and a gas and then goes straight for a Nexus. Euthermal, on the other hand, goes straight for a command center after a barracks and gas. You'll see players go for that very quickly. There are a few other terms which are a little bit more common in Legacy of the Void, which is when you're talking about someone taking a very fast third base. Is that's usually where it's a little bit more uncommon to rush that out crazy fast. So there'll be a few terms. For Terran, it'll be 3cc which means you go for a very fast third command center. There is also, of course, uh, usually you do that just after one barracks, one factory, one starport, or sometimes even just after one barracks. For Zerg, it's three hatcheries before spawning pool, obviously because the spawning pool is the most important structure for defense. If Zerg rushes straight up to three bases, they're kind of going a little bit YOLO, super greedy. It's the most economic opening they can do. Uh, we don't really have any specialized term for Protoss rushing to three base. It's normally just fast three base or fast third nexus or something like that. So those are all your expansion terms, guys. Now let's talk about um, let's talk about micro and macro. Now this is probably some of the most important terms when it comes to it's when it comes to understanding StarCraft 2. So I'm going to fast forward to a point in the game where I can talk about this a little bit. Um, generally, let's start with macro. Macro is something people will always tell you when you're starting out in StarCraft is the most important part of the game. It's large scale and overall. That's the general sense of what macro means, not just in StarCraft, but overall. It means large scale, um, overall. It's about the big picture. So essentially in StarCraft, what that means is it's getting a lot of money and then spending that money. That's what good macro usually comes down to. It's about getting a lot of units out, a lot of upgrades, a lot of tech, a lot of economy. It's about rather than focusing on individual little fights and little rushes and things like that, you're really trying to play for the later stages of the game. So there's a few tenets of good macro. So let's take a look at Neeb here um, in this game. And we can see Neeb, as most pro gamers play pretty macro heavy, um, you know, outside of very specific styles, they, they really like to go to those later stages, these people say macro heavy, and it just means they're focusing on the later stages of the game. They're building this economy. You notice three bases already up at this point. You've got all this infrastructure, all these buildings and upgrades going. Um, you know, this is just very common of pro macro play. If you're not doing some sort of very tight rush, well, you must be playing for the later game. Therefore, you're going to be focusing on this macro. And look at that. A big, some, big thing you'll, you'll often see is a very fast fourth base. And you can kind of see Neeb here just kind of sitting back and really going through his macro tasks as we leave this on his camera. He's poking around with a few units, but for the most part, he's just building lots of stuff at home and uh, chilling on out. So a couple tenants there is keep your money. Uh, so always build workers nonstop until you have a strong economy. Expanding quickly and frequently is a strong tenant of macro. And the last one is keep your money low, which can be a little bit confusing to people because they said, well, didn't you just say it's about getting a lot of money? It is. Absolutely. Getting your economy up means getting a lot of money, but equally important to getting that money uh, and that economy up so you're mining huge amounts is also to spend the money. And the reason for that is because if you don't spend your money frequently, you're simply not getting the usage out of it. StarCraft always comes down to, you know, getting the most use out of stuff during the time you can. For example, if you've got an upgrade finishing two minutes later because you didn't start it straight away, you didn't spend the money on the upgrade straight away, then you've got two minutes less where that upgrade's helping you give you that advantage. Um, likewise, if you're not building army straight away, those units are not going to be helping you out. You don't have the stronger defense because you've got money just sitting in the bank useless. So money in of itself doesn't, doesn't make good macro. However, if you have money and 
a lot of money and you spend it well, that's when you have good macro. That's the whole package. Now, usually this takes priority over micro in most games we see. Usually you'll see people say macro is the most important thing. When you first start playing StarCraft, macro is all that matters. Not necessarily true. It is kind of generally the bigger part of the game, but there are points where micro takes over the precedence. So let's talk about micro then. Um, and before we talk about that quickly, let's talk about APM because that's very important. Micro is microing units, but what's very important before we talk about that is the idea of doing a lot of things quickly in StarCraft, and that's gonna help us understand the interaction between micro and macro. So if we look here back in this game, you're gonna see during this whole phase, let's, let's put this on New Thermal's camera, and you're gonna be able to watch him kind of bouncing between macro and micro. But the important thing is this APM tab in the top left. APM means actions per minute. It's how much stuff you can get done as quickly as possible. And uh, it's important because there's so many different areas that you can focus on in StarCraft. Um, and, and APM really is what allows you to both, you know, just do as many things at once. It allows you to manage all of those different f uh, factors and allow you to do those. So here we go. Here we've got a nice little APM demonstration video from um, from Nada back in the Brood War days and Moon in this video. And you can see here a good example. It's StarCraft 1, but nonetheless, of someone spamming away on their hotkeys and their mouse, giving out tons of actions all at once. And that's an example of using those actions for a minute to do many different things. It allows you to multitask and micro in many areas of the map while simultaneously macroing. Man, it's hard managing like 50 different, <laughs> 50 different YouTube tabs to show you guys all these different examples. <laughs> so, um, so looking back in terms of in terms of that, so uh, let's let's move on. APM micro is the next thing I wanted to talk about quickly. Um, first time I've had like eight, eight YouTube tabs open for one of my shows. Um, all right, Marine King is, is the obvious example everyone goes to. Micro is like the most limitless thing in StarCraft. And this is something where people say macro is important. Macro is really important. But especially as the game goes later, micro becomes more important. Micro is control of your individual units. It's controlling groups of your army to get the maximum efficiency out of them. It can be aggressive or defensive in nature. Um, and there's so many different ways you can do this. It can be setting up an awesome surround around your opponent's army. It can be individually moving different units around. It can be pulling workers away from harassment. There's so many types of micro, and it really can be just as important as macro. There are micro-based players who focus on fighting constantly in the game, being more aggressive, and they can be just as, if not more successful than macro players. So even though people often say macro is a bit more important, it's a bit more dominant, micro is just as important a part of StarCraft. So uh, let's take a look here. We can see a little highlight from SE2 highlights from Iron Squid from way, way, way back. We're going to get to see Marines spreading against Banelings, the most common micro which everyone used to lose their mind about. And pretty much every Terran player can do it to an amazing level these days. But we see the Banelings, which are very slow but do massive area splash damage against light units. Let's watch that one more time. Um, we see them, but because they're slow off creep, and the Marines are very fast, very high damage output. Even though the Marines are very weak, they're kind of like glass cannons. As long as they spread out, so the Banelings are only ever hitting one or two Marines. And the Marines here, these last few ones, notice they keep stutter stepping as well. They run, they shoot, they run, they shoot. Constantly sniping down those Banelings before the Banelings even get into their reach. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That essentially is what micro is. There's so many different ways you can do it though. Even the smallest things um, can make a really, really huge difference. Um, so micro um, is interesting as well because sometimes players, they just can't micro everything at once. Um, whenever you do see someone who's managing to kind of control multiple areas at once, it's not like they've literally got their mouse in three different places, but they're very good at bouncing between tasks and lining things up to hit at the right time and prioritizing what needs to be looked at at what, what time. And that's why it's so impressive, for instance, when you see Neeb looking at two different areas. He's microing blink stalkers in one area and firing disrupt the shots in the other. You know, it's, it's incredibly hard to do that. And um, ooh, we got a nice little example in game here, actually. So here we've got a nice little example of a little bit of Oracle Micro from Neeb. We'll swap it on his camera. And it's very common for there to be a Widow Mine hiding up around these, this area. So notice he dives around the edge of the mineral line, 
trying to pick off the SCVs there and there, and a little bit of counter counter placement there from Euthermal, hiding a widow mine right underneath the satellite dish on top of the orbital. So it was even almost impossible to see the line from the widow mine to the oracle there. That was cute. That was cute. Uh, so yeah, playing micro uh, a micro game one spends a lot less focus on the macro tasks. Like so, if you, if you, we call someone a micro player, um, Polt back in the day used to be a big micro player. He still kind of is, but like in that he's very good at his positioning and his, his tactics, but he always actually macros up to a lot of economy as well. Um, someone who we could say is much more of like a pure micro player, someone like MC in Heart of the Swarm and so on, who'd always hit these big two base timing attacks, who'd always be trying to kill his opponent early and rely on his great killer instinct and his micro as well as his timing attacks in order to win. Um, let's go on to the next point, guys. The next point will be the metagame. So this is something where... I guess I might as well just leave this in game here. Um, I mean, so you guys have some eye candy. Um, the metagame is essentially the standard or, or popular ways of playing at a given time. Well, at least that's what the meta is. So the meta is how people are playing at a given time within the game. Everyone ends up playing into that meta somewhat, even if they don't mean to. Whether they're specifically trying to counter that meta or they're unconsciously copying that meta by trying to copy what they see pro gamers do, everyone is affected by the meta game. Of course, there's always a range of strategies. It's not like everyone does the exact same thing, but there always evolves a sort of understanding of what usually happens from any given situation or what are the available possibilities in any given situation. And that really is what defines our understanding of the metagame. There's three key things which I would say are the most important when it comes to understanding how the metagame affects yourself on ladder and pro gamers and tournaments on ladder. The first one is people start to make scouting reads based on the meta using incomplete information. A fantastic example of this is, for instance, uh, in the early days of Legacy of the Void, when there wasn't much of an established meta, we saw almost every Zerg player opening up with Overlord speed. Because they're like, I need to scout what's going on. You know, I don't understand any set meta. There's just all these crazy builds. I don't know how to read partial scouting information. I need to see everything that goes on so I know what my opponent's capable of and then I can prepare for it. But nowadays, there is a bit more of a tight meta, especially, say, in Zerg versus Terran is a really good example, where... Almost every Terran player opens up with a two Medivac Stim Marine drop. And every Zerg player, as a result, has basically been saying, look, if I just run some Zerglings in at four minutes and you've got like about 10 Marines, I know you're doing the 2 one, one. You're doing the double Medivac drop. And they've started to make that read purely based off that information. This is something where technically 10 Marines could mean a lot of things. But that one little scouting tell is all the players are using because 90% of the time in the current meta, that's what it means. So it's this sort of way to read into things based off, uh, off limited information. So that's, that's number one way we use the metagame, whether consciously or unconsciously. Number two is people start to play safe only against aggression that's common in the current meta. So people are only really watching out for the attacks which they've been seeing recently. There's an unlimited number of attacks in StarCraft, but you don't always have all of them in your head. What you do have running through your head is the last few things that traumatized you and made you cry salty, salty tears. Um, and those are the things that you tend to play safer against. They're the, tends that you, the things that you tend to watch out for and gear your, gil, your, your build, not your guild, your build towards stopping. The final thing, um, so, so another, another factor there though is because people aren't punished by builds, they, they also start to feel like it's safe because they're covering the common ones, even though they might actually be very exposed to other attacks. And that brings us to our third point of how do people use and abuse the meta? Uh, people start to do weird, unique timing attacks, weird assaults during these very specific odd windows, which maybe don't seem to make that much sense until you take into account the current meta. For instance, um, you know, there would be like the weird delayed Ling Bane timing against that 2-1-1 where the people were always, always doing this. But likewise, on the other side of things, uh, we saw people going just Ling Queen against the, the Marine drop. And I did an episode just last week on Beyond, how he added four Hellbats with his 2-1-1, and he would just roast all the Zerglings and just straight up kill Rogue, for instance, in, um, in Casper Cup. Like, Beyond was just absolutely destroying people with this small addition of something which is very strong in that metagame. He basically was like, one small addition, hit a sharp attack, punish what my opponents are doing because they're only protecting against the pure marine medevac. 
just adding a few hell bats in there totally undoes that. Um, so that's talking about the metagame. Those are the three things, really. People make scouting reads of incomplete information. People start to play safe only against aggression that's common in the current meta. And finally, people start to do weird and unique attacks because no one really expects it to be happening. And that brings us on to the next point, which does tie in with the meta a lot, which is cheese. And this is the topic which is most interesting. And I... You know, I'm, I'm a little bit kind of trepid when it comes to, to talking about cheese because there's so many passionate opinions about what constitutes cheese. And at this point, cheese um, in the StarCraft community has kind of evolved into something where it's got more of an emotional, like most people have an emotional understanding of what cheese is. Shit, did I not turn my Twitch alerts off? I'm sorry, guys. Thank you very much for all the follows and stuff. I normally turn these off. Um, whoops, I'm pressing my own, my own test button now. <laughs> Sorry guys, my bad. A little bit sloppy there. You guys just have had the voice of Arnie talking in the background the whole show. Those are all turned off now. Uh, okay, cheese. So basically people have this like emotional understanding. It's turned off now. That's the last noise. I promise you guys. I promise you. I'm a bit of a fail. Um... Somehow, 7 a.m. in the morning still gets me. No matter how much coffee I drink, there's always one thing I forget when I start the show. There's always one, always one. Uh, so cheese is, is really interesting. People have these really emotional understandings of it. So let's just uh, talk about some famous instances of cheese. Shout out to NASL. Um, of course, this is from uh, one of their VODs on YouTube, WCS 2014. And this is Hass vs. Jadon, one of the most famous games in StarCraft history. <laughs> <laughs> One of the games which built Hass's amazing legacy, where he does a five pylon wall off on the natural <laughs> expansion. <laughs> and this was just fantastic. This is one of my favorite, favorite things ever. Um, so where did my, where did my notes go? Oh my God. There it is. Uh, so basically, cheese is a strategy that relies primarily on the element of surprise and involves an inherent gamble in order to work. That, I think, is the simplest way to describe cheese while we look at this. Um, it usually sacrifices so much economy and tech development in favor of one particular attack that outright victory or crippling damage usually must be achieved for it to be successful. I think that's another phrase which someone threw out on Twitter and another phrase which someone uh, else threw out on Twitter, which I think also describes it pretty well, was it's a distinct sacrifice in order to catch your opponent off guard. It relies on the opponent not doing something in order for it to work. So, I mean, that's... <laughs> Sorry, just looking at this build always cracks me up. Um... <laughs> So there's two main types of cheese, guys. One relies on the psychological impact or the surprise of an attack, causing the opponent to not defend correctly, to make poor decisions, essentially. The other relies on them not scouting key parts um, of, of the build-up that lead into an attack, so they can catch them by surprise, and the opponent simply won't have the tools necessary. So essentially, and this is how I'm defining it, and I'm sure there's going to be people who disagree with me, but I think this is, this is a really good comprehensive way of explaining it, is it either relies on them not defending correctly because they're surprised by it and they, you know, it's something which is very unexpected or they simply don't have the tools to defend because it's something that's very unexpected. So generally speaking, if it's ever scouted ahead of time or expected, cheese is bad. If the opponent ever reacts in a specific way, it's bad. It's usually got that inherent aspect of gamble. Now let's talk a little bit about this specific game and take a little look back to what type of cheese is this? Well, I would say the key thing here was definitely that element of surprise. And anyone after this match, any of the pros or experts will tell you, Jadong had all the tools that he needed to defend this attack. He had everything he needed, but he panicked. He hadn't dealt with this before, so he kind of freaked out a little bit and he had a poor response. I don't think at any point was there a moment where it was like, oh, damn, you didn't scout the forge because you didn't drone scout. You just can't defend this. Hells no. This was something where he just needed to use his drones smartly and he needed to not overcommit once he realized how this wall was functioning. So let's talk you guys through this and see how this worked. Now, notice this is a five pylon wall. That's a massive investment. What Jadong needed to recognize here to stop this cheese is that only one photon cannon placed right here, where I'm waving my mouse, would be in range of the hatchery, which would take about 12 minutes to actually kill a hatchery. 
it would take literally forever. It would take so long. This wasn't even that big of a risk because once the wall is up, there's no way Hass can squeeze a probe through to build more cannons in front of that. He'd have to kill his own pylons. By then, creep is going to be finished at the natural. You could have spines up. You could very easily break out of this and kind of just ignore the rush. The one thing which Hass wants you to do and which Jadong took the bait on here was let's go forward, panic and say, oh God, I've got to take down these pylons. And if it's just a two or three pylon wall and there's a few really exposed points in it, then maybe, just maybe it would work. But even at this point, if Jadong pulled his drones back, realizing that Hass is easily going to get up another wall behind this, there's no weak points here. He's not going to be able to get through. Then he would actually be fine because keep in mind, there's only this one cannon and it's not even in range. But what he actually does by breaking the wall down here is Jadong actually opens up the wall. So once his drones have to retreat, suddenly Hass has an opportunity to cancel the secondary wall and throw cannons up in range of the hatchery. And because Jadong's wasted all that mining time killing a few pylons, he has absolutely no follow-up. He's got a few zerglings coming out. He's trying to put a spine down. But guess what? A spine takes longer to build than cannons. And there's going to be three cannons versus one or two spines, which aren't even done. So... That there is a perfect example of someone panicking under pressure a little bit, the element of surprise catching them off, and then simply not executing properly. Now, therefore, there's a gamble. If Jadong had read the situation correctly, made the snap judgment to react properly, this simply doesn't work. This is partly where people get salty about cheese. People get angry and say, cheese isn't a real way of playing the game. You're just gambling. What if your opponent just reacts correctly? And these people would be kind of correct in that we never see a player who plays wholly cheesy win a tournament. It just doesn't happen outside of maybe the very beginning of a game when no one really understands what's happening in the game or how to play solid. Once the game has been out for at least a few months or a year, no one wins through only cheesing. The best players in the world will mix in cheese. They'll mix in these gambles, these aggressive plays, especially if they've got good information about how their opponent's playing to know what sort of cheeses will be the most powerful, will have the most potential to kill them. However, it's going to be, you know, like I said, it's going to be a little bit, um, oops, a little bit, uh, a little bit based on their assessment of the situation. If you cheese every game, it's a gamble every game. You're not going to make it through the round of 32, the round of 16, the round of eight, the semis and the finals. It just doesn't happen. I would love for Haas to win a tournament, but Haas is a great example of a guy who cheeses almost every game, if not every game. And as a result, he is someone who um, I don't think we've seen win a big tournament outside of Taiwan. But we love him nonetheless because he does go for those crazy high variance plays. So here's the other type of cheese. Um, now this one... Let's go back just a little bit. What was that he was building up there in that <laughs> top right? Actually, no, no, let's go when he puts the DT shrine down. Here we go. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, where's my orbs? There we go. So uh, what we see here is the other type of cheese, guys. This is the type where you see a player going for the type where it's very important for the information to not be scouted for it to work. Hass's whole plan here is to proxy or sorry, hide a Twilight Council and a Dark Templar Shrine in the top right of the map, hoping it doesn't get scouted. So the Dark Templar can then hit the opponent, Firecake in this case, he won't have detection and he will just win outright. Part of the reason this is such a big gamble though is because at the highest levels of play, players recognize when something's missing. He got a full scout of the main base, realized there was only a few gateways and two Nexus and nothing else. And Firecake's alarm bells went off. He said, well, you wouldn't only have that this deep into the game. I bet you're doing something sneaky, especially because he's playing against a guy who cheeses every game. So he builds spore crawlers at every base without even having the information. So this is where we see that gimbal. This Dark Templar tech hidden in the corner of the map relied on Firecake not building detection in order for it to work. He built detection to be nice and safe, even without scouting it. As a result, the gamble is not going to pay off. Those DTs are going to be stopped in their tracks. And there's going to be a really cool moment in just a little bit as well. Um, where is it? 3150 in the VOD. Where, because it's exposed and hidden out on the map, it's such a risk because you might lose your tech. And we saw this very clutch moment where Firecake found it, sniped the pylon before the DT could warp into defend. And he actually stopped that Glaive Adept upgrade right at 99%, which is just ridiculous. This was so funny. And that's the other type of big, gambly, cheesy play, which we, we often see. <clears throat> so, um, 
I did talk there about hidden bases. So to round up today, guys, um, and shout out any questions you want, we'll try and answer those. I do want to just quickly go over that idea of proxies and hidden bases. Now, a proxy is when you build something close to your opponent's base in order to uh, in order to get, you know, kind of damage done out there and that sort of thing. So uh, basically it's to warp in units closer to their base uh, with a pylon, for instance. Um, if you're... If you're Terran, you might proxy a bunch of barracks just outside their base, so you can do a quick marine or reaper rush. Um, if you're Zerg, you proxy a hatchery, so you can run queens, zerglings, and spine crawlers in. It's essentially building something in proximity to your opponent's base, something you don't want scouted, and you want to run in there. Often, these are very cheesy builds where you proxy these things, because if it gets scouted, your opponent can prepare and then stop it very, very easily. And uh, that's what makes it very tough to make work. So here we see an example in this particular game of... Um, Big shout out to ESL, by the way, and IEM. This is a VOD from IEM Katowice. Has, uh, has first fire cake. And we see here a pylon being built right outside the base. So we can warp in Dark Templar as close as possible in order to try and make that rush work. Um, you know, it's kind of funny because I, use, I really think Proxy should also talk about those hidden things in the corner. But because that's more hidden rather than close to the opponent base, people don't like using proxy for that term because they refer to proxy as proximity. Funny story, I always assumed proxy referred to as in like a proxy legal representation, which is someone who's at the source of the problem or in the court when you're on the other side of the world and they carry out your legal issues for you. Someone who basically serves the function of yourself from another location. Um, and that's what a hidden base kind of does, right, as well is, you know, it, it it does your base stuff just in a hidden corner of the map. But apparently people have been very adamant at insisting that it is prox proximity and that's what it means in the StarCraft community. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bow to peer pressure and actually accept, whoops, uh, accept that that is what it means in this particular scenario. So anyway, um, that was like the most fucking intense way I could possibly go over these topics. <laughs> I probably just had way too many examples there. Um, I meant for this episode to be a bit shorter, but at the same time, for anyone who's new to the game, at least now you've got examples and you've got like this really detailed understanding of these concepts. And I think these are the main concepts, um, you know, micro, macro, cheese, um, proxy or hidden bases, the metagame, um, APM, and also those expansion terms. Obviously, there's a lot of other things I will have to talk about. This is just part one, by the way, of, of, of me talking about jargon. I don't know when I'll revisit it, but there's still a lot of other words which I'll cover in a future one. Um, a few that are listed here are counterattack, anti-timing, uh, counter build order, um, you know, committing, um, multitasking, stutter stepping. I kind of mentioned stutter stepping there, but splitting, cheesing. I did talk about cheese. Um, strategy versus tactic, luck, um, base trades, early, mid, late game, these sort of conceptions of parts of the game. Um, free wins and greed as well. Um, so I wanted to talk about some more of those concepts at a later date, but we don't have time today or it would be just an obscenely long episode. So uh, thank you very much guys for watching and um, let's very quickly just take a look at a few questions. SC2M says, how would you define the difference between an all-in and a timing? Um, you know, try to, try to say timing attack. I do try to do, do that more. I'm trying to get more in the habit of, of not using timing as much. Um, so a timing is something which I did an episode just last week. So a timing can be an all-in, but an all-in isn't necessarily a timing. So a timing attack, I would refer you to Artosis' blog, um, where I'm going to link it for you because I think he gives the best explanation of what a timing attack is. Um, I'm linking that in chat. You guys can check out daily number 60, uh, 65 from it's my most recent daily if you're watching on YouTube. Essentially, um, that's talking about general timing in, in, the, in the broad sense, but at the start I talk about timing as in timing attack, which is usually, when we, when we say timing, we mean it as a timing attack in the StarCraft community. And usually that is something which gains strength off a specific advantage. So a timing attack is hitting right after an upgrade kicks in or right before an opponent's upgrade kicks in. It's hitting your opponent just before they really get to take advantage of a bigger economy. So it's hitting them just after they take a third base, but before they've had enough time to mine a lot of money off it. Um, those are some of the great examples which Artosis gives. So it's it's when you have a very specific window where you are strong and your opponent is weak. That is a timing attack. Whereas an all-in is just throwing absolutely everything at your opponent. It's committing everything to one big assault. All-in is also an overused term, something I do need to talk about as well. But um, it's something where you just throw everything. And it could be a hopeless attack. It could be a horrible all-in. Whereas 
a, a, a timing is something which actually benefits off a specific strength and all in is simply where you are committing. It's not saying this is a strong commitment or this is a weak commitment on all in is simply you are committing. You're throwing the kitchen sink at your opponent. Um, or everything but the kitchen sink, depending on how you interpret the saying. Anyway, guys, thank you very much for the support. Uh, we will finish up now. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, add Twitch. Either way, make sure you send in some replays for ICFAR. Um, there may still be time if you guys have like a really good replay um, to get that in before uh, the daily two days from now. So thanks for hanging out, guys. Sorry for being such a long-winded daily today. I'll get back to my normal, trying to keep it in that 20 to 30 minute window next time. Um, I think this one was about Oh, closing in on 40 minutes. But uh, anyway, thanks for hanging out, guys. Don't forget to hug a watermelon, kick a walrus, and of course, punch a cactus to the moon. I'll catch you guys tomorrow. Goodbye and good night.